Welcome to Viewing and Reviewing, where I pull older movies off the shelf, watch them, and let you know if I believe they're worth your time to watch or not. I'm Bobby T, your online video store clerk, and I'll be searching through my VHS, DVD, and Blu-ray collection to find videos that I think may be interesting to review. In today's episode, I'll be reviewing 1981's Death Hunt, directed by Peter Hunt and starring Charles Bronson, Lee Marvin, Andrew Stevens, Carl Weathers. Let me read you the Blu-ray cover. Based on the incredibly true story of the deadliest manhunt in history, 15 years after they starred together in The Dirty Dozen, Charles Bronson and Lee Marvin team up in an exciting action film that will keep you on the edge of your seat. Lone trapper Albert Johnson, Bronson, shoots and kills a man in self-defense at his remote Yukon cabin. A few days later, lawman sergeant Edgar Millen, played by Marvin, reluctantly pulls or puts together a posse to heavily of ar heavily armed men to arrest Johnson for the murder. But bringing Albert Johnson in ends in ends up being more than anyone bargained for. After a shootout at Johnson's cabin leaves multiple men dead, Millen and his men set off into the frozen wilderness to bring the fugitive to justice. Well, first things first, this is not the incredible true story of the deadliest manhunt in history. It also isn't the deadliest manhunt in Canadian history, which the film itself comments on. This is a highly fictionalized version of the true story of the real Albert Johnson that ended not as this film suggests, but the exact opposite. That's not to say this film isn't entertaining, it is, but when someone says based on a true story, I'd prefer it didn't just take the names of the actual true people and wrote their own fiction. I mean, the trailer you're watching right now, to be honest, has, has the best sequences in it, almost like you don't really need to watch the film at all, which is kind of a cheat. That being said, Charles Bronson is perfect as Albert Johnson in this film. He's morose, silent, he has a commanding physical presence, and you actually believe he could evade a giant posse in the Canadian wilderness for a month with just a small pack, a rifle, and some snowshoes. Give the man a Bowie knife, and he's Rambo in the 1930s. The man was a legend. And speaking of legends, when you have someone like Bronson as your prey, you gotta have one of the best curmudgeonly lovable anti-heroes ever in Lee Marvin to chase him. The Blu-ray cover was wise to bring up their Dirty Dozen past because they might, um, it might be a few decades older, but it also shows virtual respect for these two aged warriors who just want to be left alone, both of them. But circumstances start the chase and all kinds of gorgeous scenery awaits. Speaking of gorgeous, lifeless scenery, Angie Dickinson, one of my least favorite 70s actresses, has a small but not so pivotal role as a rich widow who takes a fancy to leave Marvin about halfway through the film, comes out of nowhere, doesn't go anywhere, and ends with a resounding thud. Kind of like what I think of her acting career, but it's no loss, I guess. What gripes me, though, is about this. She got the third, uh, she got third billing on the cover. I mean, she's on the cover, for, or she's in the movie for a grand total of five minutes, and she got the cover? I mean, give me a break. She must have had one hell of an agent. The person who deserved third billing was Andrew Stevens, whom I did meet in real life a decade later after this film was made, and he was already a, a, a decent actor as a rookie Canadian uh, Mountie that had to learn the hard way about pretty much everything. But Carl Weathers was better as the old ex-Negro League pitcher who was more uh, beloved Marvin's uh, sidekick than he had any reason to be. The rest of the cast of the somewhat memorable bid players was decent, but most didn't have a lot to do other than to just look or act nasty and die as gruesomely as possible. Now, like I said earlier, the trailer gives pretty much the whole film away, which is a shame. I mean, watching it on HBO originally in the early 80s as a teenager, I really liked it. I've seen it several times since, and when I bought the, the Blu-ray a few years ago, I mean, I thought it was as gorgeous as I remembered. It still has the, has the big problem, though, in the editing has now become a big problem. Now, if Bronson and Marvin are the highlights, the jump cuts and poor special effects take me out of the story all over the place. This is not a reflection on the cast. As much as the cinematographer deserves a raise, the director and editors needed a stand-in. So, my overall report card of the film looks like this. Does it stand the test of time? Well, yeah, barely. B minus. It's it. The set is 1930s Yukon territory, and it looks and feels that way with the setting and the cinematography. And the actors look appropriate. I just wish the the uh, filming wasn't so soap soap opera esque in the dialogue. Story. 
Speaking of soap opera, this is an average C grade. Not great, but it also not terrible. It has the built-in draw of based on a true story that really isn't, but the first half is, is kind of a slog getting to the middle excellent explosion at the cabin that lacks uh, that, that kicks the story into overdrive, where it finally excels. The first half of the, of the movie, to be honest, it deserves a C minus, while the rest of the movie is a solid B, so that's the average. To be honest, if you started the movie where the posse surrounds the cabin before blowing it up, it's probably a B plus movie. The cast, hmm. <clears throat> It, this is rough. Bronson is an A plus as Albert Johnson. Lee Marvin plays himself in very in, in every film, and this is no exception. The rest of the group, with maybe the possible exception of Carl Weathers, are just passable. I'd give this a C plus because it really isn't special other than the two leads. Now, cinematography. Okay, this is why I remember this film. This looks and feels like the Yukon. A plus. The actors and the crew must have been freezing their tuchuses off uh, because this looked like everyone had frostbite on screen. Both Rat River and the Yukon Wilderness looked exactly like you'd expect it to look in real life. Formidable. And then we get to watch Bronson's cabin explode into smithereens while the, he comes out so, with sawed-off shotguns blazing in the fire and moonlight. And the, and the last half of the movie, the Bronson's jumping actual river canyons, climbing glaciers with an axe, and running with caribou in, feet, in, in his feet-deep snowdrifts, well, at least his stunt double was, it was breathtaking. If anyone deserved an Academy Award nomination for cinematography, it was this guy. Now the music, eh, we're back to average again. Straight C grade, nothing at all special. Actually, they kept it playing a lot of the same manic tracks every time they'd cut to Bronson during its chase sequences. It's good to let us know the Mounties and Bronson had their own soundtrack, but it, kinda, it gets kind of stale after you've heard the same tunes for an hour in the snow. So, overall, based on the above, the score is said, uh, I would, I'm sad to say, is a very average C which breaks my heart. The teenage me who grew up loving Bronson and Marvin in the old Dirty Dozen Army and Western days just does not hold up the, uh, in this film. The other positive is that I'll say it's, uh, it's light years ahead of Bronson's White Buffalo of the same era, which I may review someday when I'm looking for a sedative. Now, with the exception of exquisite landscaping and cinematographer who so masterfully filmed all of it for us, the rest of the story just felt pedestrian. The two leads are first rate, but the rest of the story and the editing pretty much tanked the overall score when it deserved a whole lot better. It's worth a watch for sure, once. But then you can probably forget it after you've shut it off, and you won't miss it if you sell the, the Blu-ray on, e on eBay. So. Here are a few other recommendations of along this same vein. Well, I mentioned, mentioned Rambo earlier, so I got to go with the very excellent First Blood, the first one here, because it really is the obvious choice as the same story 50 years in the future with one badass being chased by a mountain full of jerk cops and military guys all carrying automatic weapons. Next, Chato's Land. I don't know what it is about Bronson that pisses off so many people that they send entire armies after him in every movie and still can't kill the guy. This one is kind of cool because Bronson plays an Apache that uses the old ways to run out into the desert and ends up turning the tables on the army that's out to kill him and he starts hunting them in return. And lastly, Runaway Train. This is the story of two escaped convicts from an Alaskan prison that hijack an unstoppable train in a whiteout snowstorm that becomes a runaway at high speeds deep into the wintry wonderland. This is a forgotten film that deserves its own review someday. Well, that's it for Death Hunt. If you enjoyed the review, please be sure to click the like button below. If you want to keep up to date on, the, on future reviews, please click on the subscribe button below. If you want to purchase Death Ray on Blu-ray because the cinematography on the DVD is inferior, or if you wish to purchase any of the other titles I've mentioned earlier, please follow the Amazon links below and I'll get a small residual if you're so inclined. If you have any suggestions for movies you'd like me to review, please leave a comment below and I'll see what I can do. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, be sure to help others in need even if you get nothing in return. Have a great week.